Okay, very good uh, to see that you've all shown up. Um, I'll, um, I'm going to talk about Hong Kong, but I'm also going to talk about China, because the, what, whatever happens in Hong Kong uh, is very important what happens in China as well. Uh, and the protests have a lot to do with what's happening in China. Um, about me, um, as Klaas already said, uh, I'm a Sinologist, means I've studied Chinese language and culture ages ago. Uh, first time I came to China was in 1982, um, and China was a very different place then. It was slowly opening up after the Cultural Revolution. The universities were sort of getting there, getting back together. Um, and um, so over the past almost 40 years, I've seen China change quite a bit. Uh, at the moment, um, uh, I do lots of uh, projects, consultancy concerning China, mainly in the Netherlands. I also teach an honors class uh, about China as a rising power at the University of Amsterdam. And um, I teach a course in journalism in at a Chinese university in Guangzhou in the south. Um, so every, every year I'm, I'm in Guangzhou for about five weeks uh, and we look at news, um, uh, international news, and we look at the way international media and Chinese media um, treat subjects, what the different narratives are. Uh, and for me it's very important, I hope my students like it, but for me it's also very important as an input uh, of what's going on in China and whether the narrative changes or not. Uh, and yes, definitely it has been changing over the past couple of years. I've been doing this for like five years. So we're going to talk about Hong Kong and China and it's good to go back to 1980. Um, in 1980, China was still a very grayish, not very colorful place where people bicycled to their work, uh, where there were buses, nobody had, had their own car, uh, and, and wealth was sort of seen <coughs> as if you would have a bicycle, a sewing machine, and a watch, the three turning things. So that was what uh, people who, who were very, uh, had a lot of money, had those kinds of things. Um, Hong Kong in 1980 was quite developed and wealthy. Um, a, a British colony where um, especially the financial services industry was big, the harbor very important. So very lively, very vibrant. And Hong Kong became sort of an entry point for many people doing business in China. So Hong Kong was at the time was really important as sort of an extra, an accelerator for the Chinese economy. It's good to keep that in mind. 19, around the 1980s, um, Deng Xiaoping, the leader at the time, started to discuss the future of Hong Kong with Margaret Thatcher, the British leader. And that was because in uh, the, the Hong Kong's lease was um, ending in 1997. So there was still 17 years of uh, colonial rule and China had decided they wanted uh, Hong Kong back. So they wanted to take Hong Kong back. And that was partly because they wanted Hong Kong as part of China, but also as sort of a step towards getting Taiwan as part of um, uh, the People's Republic of China as well. So it was sort of a... Um, uh, an approach was a step-by-step -step approach. Just going forward 17 years, there was the handover. So there were lots of discussions about how um, Hong Kong would be handed back. Uh, and during all these years, and there, there, there was a basic law, there were all sorts of, uh, first a joint declaration, then a basic law. Um, the idea was, if you, if you think back of this picture of sort of a grayish, uh, not very advanced China in, in the early 1980s and a, a vibrant Hong Kong. The idea was these two systems need to coexist. China said, we're not going to destroy Hong Kong. We, we hope that we can learn from Hong Kong and Hong Kong can help China develop. 
And from, a, from the British point of view, they knew their colonial um, um, history was something that needed to end, as it ended in many other parts of the world as well. So they tried to get as many um, good deals about freedom of speech, um, sort of an electoral system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to, to make sure that Hong Kong would stay the same, the system would stay the same for the next 50 years from the handover onwards. And 50 years is a long time because it's, it's more than a generation. So the idea in, in the 1980s, while this was all being discussed, was that if you say, okay, we're going to hand it back in, seven, in 97, but there is a transition period of 50 years, we're talking about 2047. Not many people at the time were really worried about 2047. Also, because a lot of people hoped China would sort of change um, while it would open its economy, it would change into and, and adopt a liberal economic system. So here we are, 1997, handover with the Union Jack flag being lowered and the Chinese flag up in the air. Uh, and I was there at the time as a journalist covering the handover. It's very difficult to imagine now, but at the time, Midnight, the 1st of July, um, when the official handover took place, people were really worried that the Chinese People's Liberation Army would come in to Hong Kong and take control. We can't, I mean, just looking back, didn't happen, so uh, difficult to imagine. But that was really, a lot of people in Hong Kong didn't know, and the international community also didn't know. There was a deal, but nobody knew whether China would keep its part. But it did for quite a long time. So there was also in China's interest one system, one country, two systems. Now, China has changed a lot, as I said, over the past 40 years. If, when you think of China, what do you think of? just top of mind, because we need to talk about China, because I think the changes in China itself, in Beijing, but also in the rest of China, are really very important for what's happening in Hong Kong now, and also with people in Hong Kong, one of the reasons why, why people in Hong Kong decided to start and demonstrate. If you think of Hong Kong, what do you think of? Uh, sorry, <laughs> you think about China, what do you think of? Anybody, yeah. Mao Zedong, what else? Communism. Communism. Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping. Kevin Rogan. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. He smokes a lot. Yeah, smoked a lot. Um, well, I, I asked this question to quite a few people, uh, and what comes up in different... Now, everyone talks about the virus. We can talk about the virus a bit as well, but um, that's not really the core of what, uh, what we're going to discuss now. Lots of people have, over the past year have mentioned the Hong Kong protests when they talk, when they think about China. Of course, the Belt and Road Initiative, really big, um, uh, uh, trying to tie together uh, the Asian continent and the European continent with lots of infrastructure projects, uh, censorship, social credit system, all sorts of things. Um, one of the things that come up, somebody said, uh, communism, will the Chinese Communist Party survive is one of the things that people bring up as well. <coughs> now, to understand what's happening in China and China's thinking, and also the thinking of the leaders of China in Beijing, Xi Jinping and others, it's good to look at this. So we have seen the red line is China. This is accumulated GDP um, over the past 200 years. <coughs> Um, and there are a couple of things that are striking. You see that China used to be quite big and wealthy um, uh, in the world, if you compare it to other nations in the world, uh, became really low and then got up again. Here's 1980. Not very affluent. So what else is striking here is that if you look at 1820, 
the Chinese economy was a third of global GDP. So the Chinese economy was the largest economy in the world. This is Europe, just putting different European countries together. This is India. This is the US. The US was nowhere two years ago, 200 years ago. Um, and this is Latin America. This is the way Chinese people look at themselves as a very wealthy, powerful, important nation. And we tend to think of China from 1949 onwards, the People's Republic. So that's a very different perspective. So looking at history, what happened? You see this line going down. Um, one of the things here in the 18, 1840s, there were some wars between China and colonial powers. Opium wars, they were called. The British started to feed opium uh, in order to pay for all the silver and tea and silk that they wanted to get to buy from China. And they don't want they didn't want empty coffers, so they decided that they needed a commodity that the Chinese wanted and they found it in opium. So here are some wars. China shutting itself out, basically. Uh, and what you also see, and that's what you see here, somehow China missed the Industrial Revolution. So we're in the rest of the world, uh, mainly starting in Europe, but also in the US, you see that uh, industrial production really took off. In China, that didn't happen. So relatively, China's part of the world economy went down quite quickly. So you have the Opium Wars. Um, and during these, after the Opium Wars, Bits and pieces of China were, were ceded, were given or taken by colonial powers. So China has not ever been officially colonized, but in effect, in reality, this is sort of a colonization. So you see all sorts of international enclaves coming up in Shanghai, for instance, and in Beijing, in the big cities. Uh, and if you go to Shanghai now, you can still go to the French concession, for instance, which is the old French neighborhood. There's a Russian concession uh, and an international concession. Um, and then a little bit later on, in the late 1800s, um, the Qing Empire, the emperor, it sort of started to collapse with lots of trouble, wars, hunger. Um, so all that was also a reason for lots of uh, strong powers like Japan, like Germany, like Russia and France to just take bits and pieces of China, especially the, in the coastal areas. And that was also when Hong Kong was ceded to Great Britain. So in a Chinese mind, this is very much a colonial history and something that is extremely humiliating was extremely humiliating. Um, and if you ask Chinese about this period, then this is the picture they have. China being cut up like a piece of cake by all these colonial powers. So you need to go back to this picture to have an idea of why China th thought it was so important to get Hong Kong back. Now, if we look um, from a Western point of view uh, to the world um, and the way it's it, it was divided, especially at the time, we in the West think that we were pro progressive, we were free, we are free, we are pluralistic, <coughs> and we think those terms are positive. Looking at China at the time, China was backwards, not very developed, and it was called at some point the sick man of Asia. Now, last week, I had a, a, a Wall Street Journal article had a headline about China as a sick man of Asia, now, um, and that got three journalists, American journalists, kicked out of China, because they really do not like to be called that. This is historical, so I think I can say it. Um, 
looking, we also look at China as very hierarchic. And hierarchic could be a positive thing, but in our, usually in a Western way of thinking, it's not a positive thing. If you look at how Chinese people look at the same things, they look at themselves as a collective society, as a very stable society, and they are governed by the best and brightest. It's a meritocracy. So the whole system, the best and brightest come up, uh, and that's the way, um, th that, that is the best way for them to rule the country. Whereas the West, from a Chinese perspective, is very individually oriented, it's chaos, and democracy is very inefficient. And looking at the news over the past couple of years, there has also in the West, a lot of discussion has come up about the fragility of our democracy. US elections, Brexit, um, but also anything concerning terrorism, terrorist attacks that are an attack on democracy as well, fake news. Basically what, Ch what Chinese leaders at least say, but a lot of uh, of people in the, uh, uh, students and, and um, people in the population also say, democracy has no answers. We have better answers. China is a huge country, difficult to govern, and we need this meritocracy. We need the best and brightest. If we would adopt democracy, chaos would come up, like uh, they then point to the United States uh, and, and to the election of Trump and the uh, dichotomy between Republicans and um, uh, Democrats. So just looking at political developments in the world right now, from a Chinese point of view, is interesting because you see a different world. Now, China does not just look at China now, but it also has a very long-term view. 2049 is an important year because it's 100 years after of People's Republic of China, uh, as it was established in 1949. And by then, Xi Jinping, current party leader and president, says, by then, China will be a fully developed nation. We've had this century of humiliation, so that is what the, 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 the piece of cake that's being cut up. And now we are starting, and these are official terms, the great rejuvenation of China. So China is new and young and rising. And China, by 2049, China wants to be and will be the leading power in the world, is Xi Jinping's ambition. So if we look at Hong Kong, then that's the China we're looking at. It's a China that has over the past 10, 15 years become much more confident and become quite assertive, and some say aggressive. So there is a very strong nation with quite a strong economy, and what's it going to do? In Hong Kong in 2014, especially young people started to get nervous, um, irritated, and started to demonstrate. And that was the umbrella movement. And basically that, that's one of the Occupy protests. What they wanted at the time was, we have one country, two systems, and in the two systems, in the Hong Kong system, there's supposed to be democracy. And Beijing had just changed some of the rules in the way the chief executive, the leader of Hong Kong, would be chosen. Um, officially, it was what, what the Hong Kong uh, uh, population expected was that there would be a democratic procedure. But Beijing changed the rules and said, well, we're going to have a group of people who selects this chief executive, and we are going to tell you who this group of people is. So a lot of people said, well, that's not the democracy we hoped for, and that's not what, what the deal was during the joint declaration and the basic law. So started to protest. 
Um, and this whole protest is done, especially by young people. And these are people who have grown up in this uh, century. So that means that they do not have any remembrance of the colonial times. They sort of were born around 1997, maybe a bit earlier, maybe a bit later. Uh, and they know the Hong Kong, that Hong Kong was uh, after the handover. But what you see here is a small step into a new identity of Hong Kong people. So Hong Kong used to be old colonial, um, and now you can see that um, they feel they are going towards becoming part of China, but they don't feel completely Chinese, so they get worried. So we have 2014 umbrella movement and now 2019, just recently, the second since uh, June of 2019, a new really big demonstration uh, movement. Um, and the start of it was just a, a very simple rule that um, the chief executive wanted to adopt for, China, for Hong Kong. And that was, we want to be able to easily um, extradite people, criminals, to China. And a lot of people in Hong Kong who were nervous and not really trusting the Beijing government anyway, thought, well, this is really a very important step because anybody can then be extradited to China. And who knows what happens? So we don't want this. So people went out in the street first, students, then lots of other people as well. Um, and there are, they have five demands. I don't know whether you've, you've seen many pictures, but some pictures are like this. And this means we have five demands, not one less. So even if you leaders of Hong Kong give in to one demand, we're still not satisfied. Number one was, of course, no extradition. That was the, the, the first step. But then when, um, the Hong Kong government and police started to really chase demonstrators with tear gas and all sorts of other things and started to arrest people. Um, they said, well, we also don't want the protesters who've been arrested to be prosecuted. They are not criminals, so they should be set free. Then uh, they also said, well, these riots or these demonstrations are not riots uh, because a riot is punishable by law demonstration is a right. So we want you, Hong Kong government, to look at these demonstrations as demonstrations, and we don't want the word riot and rioteer. <coughs> we don't want rigged ele elections, which is similar to the umbrella movement. And, and this by now became the most important demand, we don't want impunity for the Hong Kong police, because the Hong Kong police really went out in full force uh, and there's been a, a lot of evidence of uh, severe police brutality. And the police, there were no measures taken. They just can continue to do, do their job. Um, so that's another demand. The way Beijing sees these protesters, we've seen protesters really sort of peaceful, especially in the beginning. So in, in June, July, uh, over the summer, um, um, opening up uh, alleys and, and, and passageways for ambulances, really cooperating well. So millions of people in the street, um, but still very peaceful. But at some point, things started to escalate. Um, and protesters started to push back the police and lots of fights evolved. So at some point, uh, there, there were fires and there were fights and there were Molotov cocktails, etc., etc. Beijing calls these protesters rioters, not demonstrators, thugs, um, cockroaches, um, but also terrorists. So all sorts of names, especially the terrorists, where you can, if you arrest them, you can hand out heavy sentences. A lot of the anger of the protesters is um, targeting Carrie Lam, who is the chief executive. She's the highest civil servant in Hong Kong. 
the most unpopular leader since the start, since the handover. Uh, and the other leaders were not so very popular either, so this is quite a big thing. Uh, and a lot of people see her as a puppet of Beijing. She can't really do anything unless she has contact with Beijing. So I'd like to show you, um, just to get an idea of the protests. Um, these protests were um, uh, first in the streets and then really very much from campuses. And one of the most violent protests was at Hong Kong Polytechnic. So sort of the Delft University of Hong Kong. Uh, and there was a couple of universities were, were sieged. Hong Kong Polytechnic was sieged. Uh, and the siege lasted a very long time. And it was very, very violent. So here's some impression. The protesters call it fire magic. The authorities call it terrorism. But who would have thought just a few months ago that the words Molotov cocktail and tear gas would become part of Hong Kong's daily vocabulary? This was the scene overnight at the Polytechnic University, the last campus still occupied by the protesters. The message board is having a hard time catching up with the actual events. It is easy to forget that this whole movement started with peaceful mass rallies against an ill-judged expedition room. But with no leadership amongst the students, bad leadership from the authorities, and no dialogue between the two, Hong Kong is paralyzed and paying the price. <laughs> the center of attention right now. But this story is really about the rise of China and Hong Kong's role in it. And to understand that, you need to get away from the center, past the gigantic container port where business is down because of a trade war between Beijing and Washington, and past the residential power blocks where people worry about the first recession in a decade, and the first ever here caused by political unrest. Okay, to give you an impression, so this was really, really disruptive, um, but, and there was lots of emotion and lots of aggression on both sides. So during these protests and during the siege, there happened to be already scheduled district local elections. And usually these local elections are not very important. Um, it's just a district council and whatever. My people are not very interested. But here they became important because a lot of the pro-democracy people decided to become candidates as well. And they were canvassing and trying to, to um, uh, get lots of people to vote for them. Uh, so that was the one. So th even though these elections were not seen as very important, suddenly there was a wealth of candidates to choose from from both camps, so both pro-democracy and pro-Beijing. Uh, Beijing, as we know, calls people the rioters and terrorists and thugs, etc., etc. So really two opposing camps. Um, I was in Guangzhou teaching during this time. Um, and I was looking at what the Chinese media were, um, uh, how they were covering. Hong Kong and the Hong Kong elections. And they were looking at the Hong Kong elections before the elections took place, really expecting that a lot of Hong Kong people would be completely fed up with violence, disruption, the fact that the economy was really taking a big blow, uh, and that what they call the silent majority would wipe out the pro-democracy candidates. And it would be a big win for 
the, the pro-Beijing parties, and they 100% they expected that. But that didn't happen. What happened was that the establishment pro-Beijing candidates were wiped out during the elections. So I was in, in Guangzhou, and I was waiting for state media to cover this. How are they going to explain this? Because they had sort of prepared all their audiences all the time that there was this silent majority and that really this was a small group of bandits, uh, people who, who were starting fires, etc., etc., or worse. So for more than 24 hours after the outcome of the elections, complete silence from the Beijing uh, authorities and from the state media. No word at all. And then, after 24 hours, they started, they still didn't give the outcome of the election, but they started to interview the widow of somebody who died or who was in hospital or whatever. So they started to frame the story and they started to focus on victims of the violence. And that went on for a long time. And then maybe, so, so just imagine um, media sort of prepping their audience for a big election, outcome, complete silence. So this was definitely not the kind of story and the kind of outcome the Beijing authorities wanted, but also they had just not prepared for it. So I, what I heard from people, because I teach journalism there, what I heard from, from people in newsrooms in, uh, in China, uh, that there were, in, all, there were, like in many newsrooms, lots of pre-written stories. If you think something's going to happen, you already put it down on paper, and when you see the, the outcome, then you post it uh, or publish it. So there were all these pre-written stories about the silent majority has spoken, and now we can go back to normal. But that didn't happen. So that's a big dilemma. So that's basically where we still are. And by now, we have, I think partly due to the coronavirus as well, there have not been many, many demonstrations since the Chinese New Year um, and since the start of the coronavirus. There have been some over the past weekend. There were, uh, I think 200 people were arrested in the past weekend. Nowhere in the media because we're all looking at other stories. Um, but this, so this is sort of the background and it has not been solved. Now it's interesting to also to, to think as we, we did a thinking exercise in the beginning as well, how do, how, how do Chinese people or how do leaders in Beijing see this situation? If you look at 2047, which is the end of this transition period, what do you think is going to happen to Hong Kong? Well, if you would have asked a lot of people in 1997, a lot of people would have said, after the initial sort of um, uh, shock of having to hand it over, people were sort of getting accustomed to it, a lot of people would say, well, we think China is going to move in the direction of Hong Kong and they'll, they'll sort of grow alike. We saw these pictures. Uh, if you now look at pictures of Chinese cities, um, a lot of glass and steel, uh, very modern, um, uh, appearance. So a lot of China watchers, but also a lot of business people said, well, China will probably become a liberal capitalist economy. That's what they want. Of course they want it, because it's the best system. Uh, and in the long term, democratic forces will weaken the authoritarian system of China. And of course, the big question is, isn't that wishful thinking on the part of many people who are observing? Because if you look at China and the way they look to, well, they usually look to 2049 because that's the centennial. Uh, but if they, if they look forward uh, and the end of, of, of the 50 year transition period, they say the Chinese Communist Party is a core entity in Chinese politics. We need it. It's the only um, body that can bring, uh, can, can help China and organize China. So it plays a pivotal role. And that's not going to change. We like the one-party state because 
We don't have chaos because of it. Um, and core communist values are crucial to make China strong. So ideology is starting to play a much bigger role, and especially under Xi Jinping, who came to power in 2012. <coughs> ideology became much more important. We had Deng Xiaoping, who had this ideology of, uh, of it doesn't matter whether the cat is, is black or white as long as it catches mice, so, mice, so very practical. Uh, and now ideology really is back. So um, controlling the narrative is much more important now in China than it was even, even seven years ago. So the big question is if, this is, if this is what's important for China, then where does that leave Hong Kong? <coughs> Something that strikes me, because I teach in Guangzhou, which is sort of across the border from, from Hong Kong, so I'm in the south of China quite a lot. Um, by now, Beijing is not about bicycles anymore, but this is uh, the CCTV tower uh, by Rem Koolhaas. Um, lots of modern buildings, um, uh, a booming economy until the start of the coronavirus. Um, and Hong Kong, um, as Hong Kong always was, lots of financial institutions, harbor. But just across the border from Hong Kong, there's Shenzhen. And Shenzhen, the first time I was there in 1982, was a village. You could walk across the border, a uh, small bridge, uh, and I remember being sort of entertained by Chinese authorities. They, they gave me lunch, then put me on a train to Guangzhou. This Shenzhen now is at least as modern, if not more so, than Hong Kong, with a perfect metro system, lots of big buildings, very good uh, uh, city planning. So Shenzhen, just across the border from Hong Kong, in the minds of Chinese leaders, can easily take Hong Kong's place. So if you look back to 1980, China needed Hong <coughs> Kong. If you now look at, at Hong Kong from a Beijing point of view, we rather have Shenzhen. So in Shenzhen, they have been building a financial district. And the aim, of course, is to, for the financial district to take over uh, Hong Kong's position. Uh, and a long time ago, in, in, or not long, the, the south of China is the Pearl River Delta. And they changed the name of the Pearl River Delta, which was Guangzhou, uh, Shenzhen, uh, and lots of other um, uh, Foshan, some, some uh, southern Chinese cities, into the Greater Bay Area. And that's a very political decision. So now all the talk in Chinese media is Greater Bay Area. And this is going to be the powerhouse, one of the powerhouses next to Shanghai, of the Chinese economy. And the Greater Bay Area includes not just the southern Chinese cities, but also Hong Kong and Macau. And people in Hong Kong get nervous because of that. Because they say, why would you want to integrate Hong Kong now already, we have until 2047. Why start this Greater Bay Area and start much more interaction um, between Hong Kong and just incorporate Hong Kong already in southern China? We don't like that. So from a Chinese point of view, this makes great sense, Greater Bay Area. But from a Hong Kong point of view, which is also an identity kind of thing, Hong Kong people don't feel like mainland Chinese people, especially the young people. So they don't want to be part of southern China. They want to be Hong Kong. So what we see in Hong Kong, especially over the, since the umbrella movement, basically, so for the past five, six years, um, is that where about 10 years ago, there was not a very strong Hong Kong identity. People felt, a lot of people felt Chinese. Whereas now, after all these demonstrations, if you ask people uh, of Chinese ethnicity whether they feel 
Chinese or not, uh, a majority says we feel that we're Hong Kongese. We're from Hong Kong, we're not Chinese. So the identity of the thinking, the way of thinking about themselves has changed. Basically, that's because I like to also interact. Um, that's what I wanted to explain as a background. And now I'd like to talk to you. Um, and I want your questions because it's much easier to discuss. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you touched upon the fact that Hong Kong may be less important because they now have Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't you think that uh, part of the attractiveness of Hong Kong also has to do with the legal system that they have, uh, which why uh, corporations prefer to invest in Hong Kong? Yeah. And that Shenzhen then should also adopt such a system? or How would yeah, that well work? It's a very good question because that is definitely the case. So a legal system, rule of law, is very important for business. Um, the big question is, is Shenzhen going to become like Hong Kong or is Hong Kong going to become like Shenzhen, which is basically the, the, the juxtaposition that I gave you. Um, my clear impression is that Hong Kong is becoming much more like Shenzhen because you see an erosion of these these um, institutions of the Hong Kong institutions. Uh, and you see that partly by the, the way um, uh, uh, the, the police now, for instance, is used <coughs> to uh, quell demonstrations and the fact that there is nobody that sort of looks at whether police behavior is correct or not correct. Um, so there's no, the, the checks and balances that used to be in place uh, mind you, Hong Kong was a colonial system, so uh, these were colonial checks and balances, but they were based on rule of law. A lot of these checks and balances are being eroded, and that is part of why people are worried. So um, I, I agree completely that rule of law, that laws are important for economic um, um, uh, interchange. And you can see, um, if you look at China from 1980 onwards, Deng Xiaoping started to open up uh, the, the, the Chinese economy. And the first law China adopted, um, I think in 1979, was the joint venture law. Um, so they also saw that it's for, if you want to attract international capital, you need to give some sorts of, of assurances. Uh, so I think in China, they, they are really building up a legal system. Uh, the big problem, so, so they really are making quite a lot of progress there. The big problem is that the Chinese Communist Party is literally above the law. Um, so there, there are lots of things in place, and it's much better and much easier for common Chinese people to go um, um, uh, uh, to protest um, in, in, in a court. Um, but in the end, politics are more important than these legal institutions. Thanks. Anybody else? Hi, uh, thanks for being here today. Um, so my question is about so obviously the mainland Chinese government doesn't agree with the protesters and then calling them cockroaches and stuff. Uh, do mainland normal people share this opinion or what do they think of the protesters? What is their opinion on it? Um, that depends a lot on who you speak to. Uh, for me, um, I've been, as I, I teach in, at a Chinese university uh, for five weeks a year, um, I, that's where I get part of my input from students. Um, if uh, a lot of people, if you are bombarded with one narrative all the time, um, if you only read and see that there are th th that there are riots, that there are Molotov cocktails, that these children don't listen to the authorities and to their parents, if you only see in the media. Uh, parents who don't want to know their children anymore because... Um, so if you only see, see propaganda, one-sided propaganda, it's very difficult to know what's going on. And I must say, just over the past couple of years, um, 
I, I teach journalism students who, who can think for themselves. But even so, over the years, I see that that kind of massive propaganda is doing its work. If you, if you also, uh, on Tibet, for instance, if you learn in school that Tibet was liberated by Chinese forces, that before that, uh, Tibet was backward, um, and there were religious authorities, it was feudal, and since the, the arrival of um, uh, uh, People's Republic forces helped, who helped rebuild ro build roads, etc., etc., um, they've stepped out of backwardness. If that's what you've learned in school, and you read in all the media all the time, it's, it proves to be very difficult to um, be open to another narrative. So I see, just looking at Chinese media at the moment around the coronavirus, there are lots of discussions on whether uh, uh, numbers are trustworthy or not. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, like Caixin is a magazine, uh, usually a financial ma uh, financially focused, they have excellent journalists. There are a couple of other uh, media that really try to uh, to look for real for for other information, look for the truth. Um, and a lot of the the, the scoops, the, the news stories by international uh, journalists or correspondents are based on what Chinese journalists find. So there are, uh, there are some people who really know and look for uh, alternative information. But just looking at the general public, um, over the past couple of years I see that this, well, this massive propaganda really is doing its work, uh, and that a lot of Chinese are, um, are, be are, are quite nationalistic, which can't blame them. I mean, China is really doing a lot better than 30 years ago. Um, and they feel China's strength, and they feel China needs to be taken seriously. So there's a, a very strong undercurrent of nationalism. Uh, and well, if you combine that with a very strong anti-protest narrative, um, you have to be, where do you get your other information from? Thank you. Anybody else? We have time for one short question. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> my question is relating the uh, Tiananmen democracy movement in 1989, mm -hmm. um, because it was suppressed rather quickly by the military and, and the government. I'm wondering, how does that compare to the Hong Kong demonstrations? Because they were, well, they have been able to survive for quite a long period of time now in comparison to the Tiananmen movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tiananmen 1989 started um, in April uh, and lasted April, May, June, or well, April, May, say the eight weeks. Um, and this was in the heart of political China, Tiananmen Square. Uh, um, and at the time, uh, it started as, pro uh, as, as a student protest, and then all sorts of people from different parts of society joined, uh, workers, um, teachers, etc., etc. Um, at some point, the central authorities in Beijing, uh, and, and most people point to Deng Xiaoping, the, the, the biggest, the, the, the highest leader at the time, himself decided, we have to stop this. We don't want this anymore. And this, this was 1989, which was also the year when, lots of, uh, where, when there were lots of revolutions in uh, Eastern Europe. So at some point, Gorbachev, the Russian leader, came, the Soviet leader still, uh, came to China. Uh, and the Chinese leader decided they did not want to go that way. So they decided for the sake of um, a unity of China, we don't want China to fall <coughs> apart, we're going to go in really, really harshly. So, of course, what you're referring to, why don't they do that in Hong Kong? Um, I think for a couple of different reasons. We talked about Hong Kong, one country, two system, also being sort of the, the, the testing ground for Taiwan. 
uh, if they would have done that, if the Chinese army would have sort of really handled the situation in a Chinese army way, um, then it would be, there would be zero chance of Taiwan ever joining um, uh, the, the Chinese motherland again. So they're very wary of that because that's a big price because the reuniting China and Taiwan uh, is, has been over the years one of the, one of the big important uh, uh, goals. Um, and also they would completely lose Hong Kong itself as well. So then Hong Kong now would be a completely Chinese city which they do not want. And it would also, uh, in, in um, international um, relations terms, be very bad for China's name. So what you see, and that's what you can feel even, uh, looking at these demonstrations uh, from the Chinese side of the border, um, you can feel how much effort it costs the Chinese leaders not to interfere, because in mainland China itself, they would, definitely. Um, and they, they have taken, um, uh, they've counted to 10 <laughs> numerous times, I'm sure, because they don't, so every now and then they, they show some uh, People's Liberation Army troops who are exercising or whatever, or helping clean up some mess. Or, so they, they gave, give sort of, a, a, some pricks um, to, to the Hong Kong population, like we're here, uh, and if we really think it's getting out of hand, we can do something, but I think the leaders in Beijing realize it's better not to. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your questions, very good questions today. I'm afraid we have gone over time, my apologies for that. Thank you for coming today. If you have some more questions, Artie, are you gonna stick yeah. around for a few minutes? You can Definitely. come and talk to Artie afterwards. That's it for today. We still have some sandwiches left. I'd also like to note that today's lecture has been recorded and will be up on the SG website and on our YouTube channel in about a week's time. You can also find the rest of our program, upcoming events over the next few months as well. So uh, thank you, Artie. Thank you.